kings, our creator, our redeemer. He loves us unconditionally, no matter what we've been through, where we've been, what we've done. He promised he'd never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. 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 Goodness. We're just so grateful and thankful. We have a lot to be grateful for. Amen. We really do. We're all alive. We're all well. When people aren't feeling well, we have to just, we suffer when they suffer. Amen. Amen. It brings tears to my eyes to see the little, little children suffer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's just so sad. But I'll tell you what, we have Jesus and he's going to heal her. Amen. He's going to heal her. It says, uh, elders of the church, we pray over her, anoint her with oil, and she is going to come back to us soon. Amen? Amen. Better than ever. They say the bird with the broken ring could fly higher. Amen? Amen. All right. <laughs> All right, let's start off tonight in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let's do it. Wow. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 30. Yeah, you said peace today. Oh, that's tomorrow. Sorry. I'm not dead. Now we're on the chapter 30. We've got verses 11. Let's see what we got over here. I didn't even check this out yet. Okay, I gotta get this in there. Coming up in a different version. Deuteronomy right. chapter 30. So you got verse 11. We are going to. Verse 6. How's that? As always, the Holy Spirit will be taken over as they go into these scriptures. So please clear your hearts and your mind of any bitterness or resentments tonight. So you can receive the message the Spirit is trying to say to the church tonight. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right. I know it's an important message because the, the devil is trying to give me fear and anxiety right now. I know it's an important message that has to go forward. Amen. Jesus has got my back. Amen. And so do my brothers and sisters. Amen. Hallelujah. We all have the strength of the Lord on us. And his fear and his anxiety. He's the ultimate comforter. Amen. All right, verse 6. The Lord your God will change your heart in the hearts of all your descendants so that you will love him with all your heart and soul and you may live. The Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate and persecute you. So, any of our enemies, the Lord will put the curse on them. We should never ever try to retaliate against our enemies because the Lord said, I'll turn it around and put it on you. You've got to leave it in His hands. We don't, definitely don't want Him to turn it around. We pray for them. We pray for our enemies. Pray that God will heal them and save them. A big amen there, right? Amen. Okay. Look at verse 8. Then you will again obey the Lord and keep all his commands that I am giving you today. The Lord your God will then make you successful in everything you do. So there's such a reward for being obedient to God. He will make us what? Successful in everything we do as long as we follow his ways and do things the way he tells us to do them. Amen? Amen. He will give you many children and numerous livestock. And he will cause your fields to produce abundant harvests. For the Lord will again delight in being good to you. As he was to your ancestors. The Lord your God will delight in you. If you obey his voice. See it? The Lord your God will delight in you. If you obey his voice. And keep it the commands and decrees written in this book of instruction. And if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Now there's a condition right there attached to it. You see it? Look at verse 10. The Lord your God will delight in you if you obey his voice. Now, one thing we have to understand is always going to be two voices coming into our heads. God's voice and the voice of what? The devil. Which one are we going to listen to? If we're living and we're living sinful, we're not going to hear God's voice. We're going to hear the voice of the devil, and he's going to try to make his voice sound like God's voice. Oh, you need to take a break. You're tired. Don't worry about going to church. Don't worry about giving. You need a break from all that. You've been doing a hard job. And that sounds all good, like God's giving you a break. But God will never, never, ever take you out of church 
or stop you from doing what he commands you to do. Amen? Amen. The devil will just to what? Gratify our flesh. Especially when we're weary or discouraged or tired or hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Amen. The devil comes in and tries to what? Get the flesh. He comes in. And sometimes he wins. We know how it works. We're not perfect. Thank God for his grace and mercy to begin to fresh every day, right? Yeah. But we'd, have, we'd definitely be in big trouble. Imagine if he said, I'm going to give you one shot after you get saved. Follow me and obey me. If not, you're done. Yeah. Thank God for his grace and mercy, right? Yeah. That's how most people are, right? You go to your job, they give you one, two warnings. If you don't perform right, what do they do? Get a pink slip? Or well, maybe not even a pink slip, maybe a <laughs> no slip, you're out of here. Yeah. Everybody has limitations, but God has no limits. It's unconditional. Thank you, Jesus, right? Yeah. We understand that. We understand we're going to fail. We don't use it as an excuse. We understand it. We pick ourselves up again, dust ourselves off, and get in the right direction. Yeah. Don't go backwards. Right. Now, look at verse. The choice of life or death, verse 11. This command I am giving you today is not too difficult. Listen now. It's saying, this command I'm giving you today is not too difficult for you, and it is not beyond your reach. In the flesh, you can't do it. In the spirit, you can do it. It says it's not too difficult for you, and it's not beyond your reach. It is not kept in heaven so distant that you must ask, who will go up to heaven and bring it down so we can hear it and obey it is not kept beyond the sea so far away that you must ask. Who will cross the sea to bring it to us so we can hear it and obey? No, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart so that you can obey. What do you mean on your lips? When you talk about the Lord and His ways, it will give us the opportunity we can obey it. Because it's circulating in our mind. It's coming out of your mouth. God's word, God's ways, God's things. All the things of God. Now listen. Today I'm giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. Now before I go on, we have to understand this one thing. It's a choice. All of us have a very important choice to make each and every day as we walk with the Lord. He never takes away our free will. Though we wish we would sometimes, because sometimes our flesh makes the wrong choices. But it says, I'm giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and keep His commands, decrees, and regulations. How do you do it? By walking in His ways. So what do you do? You hear this, you come to Bible study, you read the Bible. Then what do you do? You put it into practice. And you say, okay, I'm going to live by that today. When things get, get rough, I'm going to just pray about it instead of worry. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get angry. I'm going to be joyful. I'm not going to get bitter and resentful and give the devil a foothold in my life. Mm -hmm. And going to say, don't think just because you're coming to church, that's going to change that. Because troubles are going to come. It's how we handle them that matters. Are we growing into the image of Jesus by keeping our mouth shut when we should, open it when we should, and what? What's coming out of our mouths? You have to listen. Listen to the voice that's coming out of your mouth. Is it healthy? Is it edifying? Is it building people up? Or are you bickering, complaining, and whining about everything in your life? God's saying, if you're going to do that, you're cursed. You're cursed because you're, you have a choice not to do that. You're choosing to be miserable. You're choosing to obey the devil. You're choosing to obey your flesh. And you're actually complaining when I gave you all this resurrection power so you don't have to complain anymore another day in your life. You can be joyful for the rest of your day. And the devil wants us to what? Bicker and complain and say that this walk is too hard. I can't do it. It takes up too much of my time. I'm always busy, 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 busy. Well, you know as well as I do, I don't hands are the devil's playground. Mm -hmm. So we should always stay busy working for the Lord. Amen. We don't need a break. Believe me. We need what? We need to take on more and more. So we can what? Become like him more and more. The more time you spend with God and as Christians, the more you become like God. 
They get a big amen there. And the Bible tells us exactly how to do it. Now, look what it says. By walking in Israel. If you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are going to enter and occupy. So he's saying he's going to bless you wherever you go. It's going to be a blessing wherever you walk, he's going to be with you. But, now look at verse 17. Here's a fair warning to us Christians, right here, right now. But, if your heart turns away and you refuse to listen, that was, that's where a hard heart is. Mm -hmm. A hard heart is a closed mind. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if you're drawn away to serve and worship other gods, then I warn you now that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live a good life in the land you're crossing the Jordan to occupy. Today I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Well, I want to make the choice. How can I do it? Well, let's read verse 20. It's going to tell us how. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying Him. Here's the first one, loving Him. The second is that Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. So he says, loving the Lord your God, obeying Him, and committing yourself firmly to Him. This is the key to your life. Everybody's wondering, what's the key to my life? It just told us what the key to your life is. To what? Love the Lord your God above all else. Obey what He tells you to do. And what? Wholeheartedly commit yourself to Him. And it says, this is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How's the big amen there? Yeah. It's the key to your life. Amen. So, we got God's grace, we come to church. Do we have to do that? There's the problem. We don't have to do it. Here's the thing, though. We should want to do it. Yeah. See, He changes our desires when the Holy Spirit comes in us. We want to please God. We want to obey God. We want to do His will. We don't want to obey the desires of our flesh anymore. Yeah. When we do fail and fall to it, we hate it. We can't stand it anymore. We know we're going to fail, but we no longer have to obey the lusts of the flesh. And if you know the Holy Spirit's living in you, and you choose to do that, don't think God's discipline here is not going to come on you. You're not, you can come to church for the rest of your life and be miserable, because you're not obeying Him and committing yourself to Him and saying no to the flesh. And yes to the Spirit. And I can make that for this. Not rocket science. You could do this by loving the Lord, obeying the Lord, and committing yourself firmly to Him. You know when you guys, when anybody wants something really bad, or they commit to getting it? Yeah. Oh, I love that thing. And you work and work and work till you get it. You're committed to it. You've got a goal you set. And then you finally achieve it and you get it. That's what he wants you to do with him. Can I get an amen? Amen. He wants you to commit. He wants you to what? Get obsessed with Jesus. Amen. Like, people tell me... It, it, I bet you can't wait to go to church. I said, how did you know that? <laughs> how did you know I can't wait to go to church? Because you're going to deal with us all day. Exactly. <laughs> 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 they know. They absolutely know how wretched their flesh is when you, have, when you bring light in there. I'm quiet. Don't say much. Help anybody whenever they need it. Don't get involved. Don't stop talking about people are chiming in. Quiet. Where's John? He's painting cars like he's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. He's not in the corner looking what everybody else is doing, seeing what everybody else's mistakes are. Huh? How can I get my job done if I'm looking at everybody else's doing? That's right. I didn't get hired to watch people and throw them under the bus. I got hired to paint cars. So if I just sit down, shut up, and paint cars, then the boss is going to leave me alone. Amen. But if I what? Go in the other areas, start meddling and talking about people. Then I'm going to get what? The riot act read from the boss. How come these cars ain't getting done? Yeah. Well, it's too busy gossiping. Yeah. <laughs> and talking about people. He says, I don't know. That wasn't in the contract when I hired you. 
Now get back in the booth that came some gods. Get it? But the flesh always tries to, it always wants to go there. Oh, I can't believe this, the conditions, this, that, the other thing, the pop, 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 the traffic, the people, my wife, the kids, everybody. Ha, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> Instead of saying, thank you, Jesus, yep. for giving me all these things to honor you and all this opportunity to serve you through all the storms of my life. But a big amen there. You can have joy in all the storms if you choose. Yep. All right, let's go to Mark 14. Does everyone remember what we got thought? 66. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make sure this time I got it. Let's <laughs> back up a little bit. Go to 62. <laughs> Jesus said, I am, or the I am is here, or I am the Lord, Exodus 3, 14. And you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand, Psalms 110, 1. And coming on the clouds of heaven, Daniel 7, 13. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, Why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they all cried. He deserves to die. Imagine, they, they want God to die. <laughs> they want to kill God. Just like, just like people do. They don't want God yet. They don't want him in America anymore. They want to kill him. How do you kill God? Shut the Bible. That's how you kill God. You can't hear his voice anymore. Now, before we go on, <laughs> to the first question, Jesus made no reply. Okay, he made no reply because it was based on confusion and erroneous evidence. Okay, not answering was wiser than trying to clarify the fabricated accusations. Okay, but if Jesus had refused to answer the second question, it could have been taken as a denial of his mission. Instead, his answer predicted a powerful role reversal. Sitting at God's right hand and in the place of power, he would come to judge his accusers. And they would have to answer his questions. Psalms 110.1 and Revelations 20.11.13. Wow. He would have flipped it around. You're going to have to answer to me. So he knew exactly when this, Jesus was wise, right? Yeah. He knew when to speak, when not to speak. Yeah. He always, look at verse 65. Then some of them began to spit at him. And they blindfolded him and beat him with their fists. Prophesied to us, they jeered. And the gods slapped him as they took him away. Oh my goodness. This trial by the high council had two phases, okay? A small group met at night, John 18, 12 to 24. And then the full high council met at daybreak, Luke 22, 66 to 71. They tried Jesus for religious offenses, such as calling himself the Son of God, which according to the law was blasphemy. The trial was fixed. These religious leaders had already decided to kill Jesus. They already knew. Luke 22, 2. Peter denies Jesus, okay? There it is. Meanwhile, Peter was in the courtyard below. One of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, You were one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. Peter denied it. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. Just then, a rooster croaked. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, this man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter and said, You must be one of them, because you are a Galilean. Peter swore. Now, this is the one that walked on side of Jesus, seen him do all the miracles, but he knew. If he said, yeah, I do know him, 
they would have did the same thing to him what they were going to do to Jesus. And he wasn't willing to do that. And he said, a curse on me if I'm lying. That's what he's saying. A curse on me if I'm lying. That's how much he's lied. He said, even curse me if I'm lying. Mm -hmm. The human heart, right? Mm -hmm. Liar, liar, pants on fire. I don't know this man you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And he broke down and wept. What happened? That instant when he did it, what about later? He come to his senses. He said, what did I just do? How many yeah. times do we do that? How many times do we deny Jesus, gratify our flesh, then say to myself, why did I just do that? Mm -hmm. yeah. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Weak, weak, weak. Peter walked with Jesus, said he was going to die with Jesus. How many people, so-called Christians, come into churches and say, I gave my life to the Lord. <laughs> I gave my life to the Lord back in 72. You sure you want to say that? Gave your life to Him? Giving your life to the Lord requires sacrifice. Not being able to go anywhere when you want to go anywhere. Not being able to do anything before Him. Not saying I need to take a break. I've been working hard for Jesus. No, if you're dead, the Bible says your flesh is dead if you want to serve me. If you want to hang on to your life down here, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will save it. Giving up your life, is this is everything. Nothing, I mean nothing comes between you and Jesus. Money, people, family, nobody. And when you put it for us, he says, all these things will be added unto you. And people wonder why their lives are still miserable and they can't enjoy all that stuff because they use that as God. And then they forget that Jesus said, no, I'm God. You're worshiping the things I created over me. What do you mean? I'm not worshiping them. Yes, you are because they're taking precedence over you. They're becoming first in your life. What did King David say to the king that was going to give him a sacrifice to give to the Lord? He said, I will never offer anything to my God that hasn't cost me something. That's a true believer. A true believer will give up his life in a minute for his brothers and sisters in church, brothers and sisters everywhere, and the phone will always be on to answer when somebody needs you. And you hear it, and then you get back to them, and you pray with them. That's what brothers and sisters in Christ do. They don't get a busy signal. I'm tired. I can't, I'm not talking to anybody today. Is that what Jesus does? Never. Never, never, never. That's why we all say, Oh yeah, I love Jesus. Do you really love Jesus? If you love me, you will obey me. And obeying me is dying to yourself and becoming like me. Can I get a big amen there or an ouch? <laughs> because it's the truth that will set you free and it's the truth that will set you free now how can you do this by saying you know what I'm going to make a new commitment I'm going to get up today and I'm going to commit myself to him and I'm going to put it to the test I'm going to put it first I'm going to serve whatever capacity God gives me he saved me for and I'm going to put that first and I'm going to see if everything else falls into place in my life and it will. If you put him first. And you're not just playing church. Can I get a big amen there? Amen. Right. Before we go on. Caiaphas' home is where Jesus was tried. Okay, It was part of a huge palace with several courtyards. John was apparently acquainted with the high priest. And he was let into the courtyard along with Peter. Okay? Okay, it's wrong with Peter. It is easy to get angry at the high council and the Roman governor for their injustice in condemning Jesus. 
But Peter and the rest of the disciples also contributed to Jesus' pain by deserting him. What do you think hurt more to Jesus? Them deserting him? Or what they, he was going through with the high council? Just like if you, one of your friends walks away from you when you're in a time of trouble. What hurts more? The trouble or the one who walked away from you when the trouble came? So wow, I thought you were my friend. Just Jesus was human. Just imagine what he felt. He felt what? Betrayed and deserted. It wasn't just Judas who betrayed him. They all did. They all walked away. And what do you see? People walk away from God and they don't get their way. Like he's some genie. Like I came to God. Why do I need to change? I have everything already. I'm just coming to God so I don't go to hell. Doesn't work that way. You're in hell with all the stuff that you're putting over God. I get a big amen there. Amen. All right, let's go to chapter 15. You ready now? Yes. Okay. Let the Spirit speak. You want, you want prosperity down here? The biblical way? <laughs> You're going to die. Mm -hmm. That's how you get prosperous down here. Dying to self. Okay. Jesus is trying before Pilate. Very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and teachers of religious law, the entire high council, or the Sanhedrin, right, met to discuss their next step. They bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Okay. Before we go on, why did the Jewish leaders send Jesus to Pilate? The Roman governor. The Romans had taken away the Jews' right to inflict capital punishment. So in order for Jesus to be condemned to death, he had to be sentenced by a Roman leader. Mm -hmm. See, they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. The Jewish leaders wanted Jesus executed on a cross, a method of death that they believed brought a curse from God. That's what Deuteronomy 21, 23 tells us. Mm -hmm. They hoped to persuade the people that Jesus was cursed, not blessed by God. Wow. There was so much more to it. All right, verse 2. Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, You have said it. Isn't that awesome? He didn't say, Yeah, I am. He said, You said it. Why am I going to say it? You know I am. Then the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes. And Pilate asked him, Aren't you going to answer them? What about all these charges they are bringing against you? Okay. <laughs> the Jewish leaders had to fabricate new accusations against Jesus when they brought him before Pilate. Okay? The charge of blasphemy would mean nothing to the Roman governor, so they accused Jesus of three other crimes. Encouraging the people not to pay their taxes to Rome. Huh. Claiming he was a king. The king of the Jews. And three, causing riots all over the countryside. Tax evasion, treason, and terrorism. All these would be cause for Pilate's concern. Wow. Okay? Wow. Look at verse 5. But Jesus said nothing. Much to Pilate's surprise. Pilate said, how can How can this be? He's like, I'm confused. How come this guy's not trying to get out of this? What, what is up with him? See, they noticed something different about Jesus. He didn't just try to defend himself. He didn't go crazy. He didn't flip out when everybody was accusing him like us Christians do. We go out in the world and the, and the unbelieving world comes at us. We automatically come back at them and say things to them. He sends us on a mission to our jobs. He sends us to our, a mission on the highway, on the road, in the stores. And what do we do? We react in a fleshly way to the people at work. We react in a fleshly way on the road. We act in a fleshly way in the market. We act in a fleshly way everywhere we go. When he's saying, I sent you out there to keep your mouth shut. And I sent the people to accuse you. So you can become like me. Keep your mouth shut. 
And what do we do? We don't think about God is sending me them people to me yeah. to change me. Yeah. That's what maturity is. Knowing that God sent them to you so you can pass the test. Yes. How many times do we fail? Over and over and over again. We wonder why we're going to keep taking it. We won't have to keep taking it. And God wouldn't be putting all these crazy people in front of us if we would just pass the test. Keep quiet when you're supposed to. Thank them. Be courteous and kind. Feed your enemies. Love your enemies like God tells you to do. And they'll be like, poof, they'll be gone. And I got an amen there. Amen. So what are we doing? We try to be Jesus, right? Opening up big mouths. When we know we should keep it shut. Try to defend God. Like we need a, God needs us to defend Him. No, we need Him to defend us. He's our advocate. He's the Holy Spirit. He's the one. All you have to do is stop for one second before you react. And just let the Holy Spirit take over. And then you'll be fine. But we're just so woof, right out of that. Get accused, the accuser comes, which is the devil. But God uses the devil to transform us. It's not the people, it's the devil that works behind the people. And he's flicking his chops at us. Say, I thought you said you follow Jesus. You're following me right now. You didn't know that. <laughs> it just came out of your mouth. I love Jesus. All right. Now, verse 5. Why didn't Jesus, Jesus answer Pilate's questions? Why didn't he answer? It would have been futile to answer, and the time had come to give his life to save the world. Jesus had no reason to try to prolong the trial or save himself. His was the ultimate example of self-assurance and peace which no ordinary criminal could imitate. Nothing would stop him from completing the work he had come to earth to do. Isaiah 53, 7. Now, what comes in the way of God completing the work he saved you to do? That's the question. He saved you to serve him. Now, what's getting in the way of that? You, the flesh. All right, verse 6. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner. Anyone the people requested. Now one of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. All right, the guy was a murderer. Okay? And they said, let's release him. Barabbas was arrested for his part. What's something he was arrested for? Barabbas was arrested for his part of rebellion against the Roman government, okay? And although he had committed a murder, he may have been a hero among the Jews. The fiercely independent Jews hated to be ruled by pagan Romans. They hated paying taxes to support the despised government and its gods, okay? Most of the Roman authorities who had to settle Jewish disputes hated the Jews in return. The time was right for rebellion. So they were glad that Barabbas did that. Because they hated that Roman government. Okay, verse 8. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. As usual. This crowd, now listen, this crowd was most likely a group of people loyal to the Jewish leaders. The crowd. But they were, but where were the disciples in the crowds whose days earlier had shouted? Praise God in the highest heaven. Jesus. Jesus' sympathizers were afraid of the Jewish leaders, so they went on into hiding. Another possibility is that the multitude included many people who were in the Palm Sunday parade, but who turned against Jesus when they saw that he was not going to be an earthly conqueror and their deliverer from Rome. See, that's who they were looking for. They were looking for some big king who was going to set them free from Rome. And since they said he wasn't going to do that, we don't want him as our king. Verse 9. All motive. Would you like me 
Because remember when he came and riding on the donkey? Everybody was for him. Right? I came. He thought they were coming, he was going to come in and take over. Get rid of the Romans and they were going to disrestore them again. Mm -hmm. Bible said, would you like me to release? Would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews, Pilate asked? For he realized by now that the leading priest had arrested Jesus out of envy. So he figured it out. He figured it out. Now, if, before we go on, the Jewish leaders hated Pilate. They hated him. But they went to him for the favor of condemning Jesus to crucifixion. Pilate could see that this was a frame up. Why else would these people who hated him and the Roman Empire he represented ask him to convict one of their fellow Jews of treason and give him the death penalty? He said, why would they do that? So he was on to him too. Look at verse 11. But at this point, the leading priest, the leading priest stirred up the crowd and demanded the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Now, there's a reason, there's a reason why they crucify him now. There's a difference here. Crucifixion was the Roman penalty for rebellion. Okay? Only slaves or those who were not Roman citizens could be crucified. If Jesus died by crucifixion, he would die the death of a rebel and slave, not of the king he claimed to be. This is just what the Jewish religious leaders wanted, and the reason they whipped the mob into a frenzy, in addition, crucifixion would put the responsibility for killing Jesus on the Romans. They were brutal. Now Pilate, look at verse 14, why Pilate demanded? What crime has he committed? But the mob brought even longer, crucify him. They're not even answering him, just kill him, we don't. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. Then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Now, did anybody see The Passion, the movie The Passion? I mean, it couldn't have got more graphic than that when they did that to him. They tied him up, they chained him to the, the um, like a block of wood, a, a tree stump. And they just ripped his back wide open. These little pieces of lead in the end of the whip. Every time they whipped him, just ripped his skin wide open. Just imagine the pain and the agony he had to go through. They couldn't give more than 39 lashes because they say after 40 it would kill him. So they knew just how much to do to inflict that kind of pain on him. Now, so I've got a very important to talk about this before we move on. Verse 15. The region of Judea where Pilate ruled as governor was little more than a hot and dusty outpost of the Roman Empire. Because Judea was so far from Rome, Pilate was given just a small army. His primary job was to keep the peace. Okay? We know him from historical records that Pilate had already been warned about other uprisings in his region. Although he may have seen no guilt in Jesus and no reason to condemn him to death, Pilate wavered when the Jews in the crowd threatened to report him to Caesar. That's what they did. John 19, verse 12. Such a report accompanied by a riot could cost him his position and hopes for advancement. So he did it for political reasons. Like everybody else does things for political reasons. Now, before we go on. Although Jesus was innocent according to Roman law, Pilate caved in to political pressure. He abandoned what he knew was right. Now, trying to second guess the Jewish leaders, Pilate gave a decision that would please everyone while keeping himself safe. When we ignore God's clear statements of right or wrong, now listen to me, when we ignore God's clear statements of right and wrong and make decisions based on the preferences of our audience, we fall into compromise and lawlessness. God promises to honor those who do right, not those who make everyone happy. Mm. 
Now, you know I've been on this pulpit for a while, and you know I'm not up here to make everybody happy. <laughs> I'm here to give everybody the truth. And sometimes the truth doesn't make you happy. Sometimes the truth is very convicting and hard. But that's what the Holy Spirit tells me to do as a pastor. To teach the truth. Not to make the pews full. To make the people like Jesus. If I water down the message and just say prosperity, just come in, don't worry, just give you everything you want. These benches will be packed jammed. But because we don't do that here, we're not going to get a jammed pew. But that's okay. Uh, guess what? One at a time, God's going to send the true believers into this building. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's going to fill up the church with what? His people. Mm -hmm. His people. Not the devil, not the synagogue of Satan. We're going to fill it up with God's people. Can I get any money? Yeah. So that's why we don't go out and solicit God. Because what am I going to do? Go across the street and say, hey, hey, there's a church next door. Like they don't see it. Mm -hmm. Like they don't probably buy a church every day. You do that, you bring the wrong people in here. Because they're not called by God. God is the one responsible for the increase of the church. Not me. Not me. God is. And we've had a few people come in with a testimony saying, I guess something happened, I came in. Mm -hmm. uh, and our sister, um, what's her name? Robin. She came in one day and said, oh, she just felt the love of God in here. She never left. So if you bring the right people in, they'll sense the spirit and the love of God in here, and they'll find a home. Yeah. And that's what we want. People of God here. Mm -hmm. One body, many parts. We don't want Satan's parts in here. Right. So as long as God sustains his house, we're okay. Right. Amen? Mm -hmm. That's why it doesn't really it doesn't really affect me, because I know I'm not responsible for the people that come in. God is. I'm responsible for giving the message the right way. Okay. And as long as I do that, God will send the right people in. And he tests our faith every day. Well, how can people, people leave because they don't belong? They don't leave because of anything that I'm saying. Because anything I'm saying is coming from the word of God. It's nothing to do with me. People question, well, why did they leave? Well, they left because they didn't want the truth. Yeah. They wanted somewhere to go stretch the itchy ears. They didn't want to change. It's all about change and transformation. You can't keep coming here and not change. It'll, you'll get so sick of it, you'll end up walking out. But isn't that the very reason why we get saved, so we can change? Mm -hmm. Obviously, there had to be something wrong with us if we need salvation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Big amen, right? <laughs> Because sometimes, you know, I'm, uh, I'm praying and the Lord will give me a message and I'm like, Lord, you sure? And then you go. He said, if you don't tell them, I'm holding you accountable. Remember Ezekiel? He said, Ezekiel, they're not going to listen to you. But you go tell them. Jeremiah, all the prophets, they didn't want to hear nothing. Judgment's coming. Rebel. Turn for God. Turn away. Repent. Come back to God. No, we don't want that message. There's 400 false prophets saying, peace and prosperity. Live the way you want. Eat, drink, and be merry. It's going to be okay. That's terrible, right? Is that the truth? No. It's not going to be okay. Judgment's coming. Yeah. All right, verse 16. We're going to close in a couple minutes. Yeah. The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters, called the Praetorium, and called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe, and they wove thorn branches into a crown, into a crown, and put it on his head. Now, the thorn branches, we're not talking about the rose bush out in the corner here. We're talking the thorns. They're like this long. And they just stuffed it on his head. Just imagine. On a crown, and they put it on his head. Then they saluted him and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the head with a reed stick, spit on him, and dropped to their knees in mock worship. <clears throat> wow. That's making me like... I'm crying. That's what Saturday is. And he still did, he still went through it for us. He went through that for us. If he said, no, I'm not going to go through with this, 
All of us would be going to hell right now. He was obedient unto death. And all he's asking for us to love him and obey him. And when you hear this and say, wow, I can't even do these little things. I can't even keep my mouth shut on these little things. When he didn't do anything, he didn't get, and he got persecuted and mocked. And I can't even do that for him. I can't even, I can't even obey him. After all he's done for me. Now listen, before we close, the brutal gods, the power-hungry governor, and the convening religious leaders had the upper hand. But they did not know the true power and authority of this man they were torturing and had condemned to death. Worldly powers and philosophies that mock Jesus' lordship will not be so arrogant when Jesus returns in judgment. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. When you feel that unjust people who have controlled the viewpoints hostile to Christianity are carrying the day, rest assured that Jesus holds the highest place and will return in glory. Jesus is coming back. And he's going to settle all the counts. So as it gets darker and darker out there, it's going to get brighter and brighter in here. Because we're not found, we're not letting that stuff in this church. All that stuff the world is accepting is not coming through them doors. It's going to come through them doors in repentance, not in acceptance. How about an amen there? It's going to come in repentance, not in acceptance. We accept everybody to come through the door. We accept the sin and we hate the sin. The sin has to stay out. A little leaven, leaven the whole lump, right? Amen. Right, we're going to close there. Drew, why don't you come up and close us? Thank you. What's, what, uh, we gonna start with? We're going to, um, verse 20. That's how it is. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm just so grateful for everything you do for us, Lord. I just pray that we can live honorable lives, Lord, to show our gratitude for you, Lord. I just pray that you continue to encourage our hearts, Lord, and let us focus more on the word, Lord, so we understand the things and trials we go through, Lord. I just pray you draw us closer as a body, Lord, to encourage us and to encourage each other, Lord, in this, these, tr these tough times, Lord, and I just pray that you continue to be with us, Lord. Thank you for your word, and thank you for everything you teach us through your word, and I just pray that you continue to protect us and watch over us, and Jesus can have Amen. Amen. All right, thanks, dude. All right, we're going to see and watch your video.